Hello, and welcome to the National Human Genome Research Institute's third event in our Genomics and the Media series. My name is Sarah Bates, and I'm the Communications Chief for NHGRI. I'm very excited today to give a short introduction before I turn it over to our moderator and our special guest. Today's topic, using the media to connect science and humanity, specifically genomics and humanity. How do we communicate about basic science findings that have potentially deep social significance? Particularly, how is research on human genomics and genetics being presented in the press and on social media? How has it been misconstrued? And how are geneticists, communicators, and educators responding? With conversations like this one and more, Effective science communication depends on us to have conversations like this one to examine and explore new ways to get accurate, helpful science news to people. Each event in this series will feature a trailblazer in science communication, talking about their craft with someone at NHGRI and taking questions from all of you. Each guest is an expert in communicating about genomics across media, from podcasting to preprints to everything in between. NHGRI's goal with this series is to talk about the different approaches for communicating about the fast-paced field of genomics, to give you behind-the-scenes stories about breaking news, as well as to discuss the unique challenges and opportunities each medium can bring. We have a truly amazing lineup for the series, from author Dor Dorothy Roberts to podcaster Elizabeth Lane to radio correspondent Joe Kalka. And today we get to talk with the incredible Amy Harmon of the New York Times. The series will run through 2022. You can find details at the on the screen at genome.gov slash GAM. And now I will get to introduce our moderator for today. Today's moderator is Dr. Eric Green. He is the director of NHGRI and has been for more than a decade. He was appointed by NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins in 2009. You may know him as at NHGRI underscore director on Twitter and as a huge baseball fan, I hear it's the season. Please send us your questions on social media with the hashtag genomics in the media or drop them in the question feature on Zoom. Thank you all for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Green. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we are grateful that you are joining us either live or after the fact by watching a video recording of this, which will be available on our YouTube channel uh, uh, called Genome TV. But, Today's guest is a terrific one, and I'm really delighted to have Amy Harmon as our guest today for the Genomics in the Media series. Amy's a national correspondent for the New York Times, covering the intersection of science and society. She uses narrative storytelling to illuminate the human dilemmas posed by advances in science. Amy has won two Pulitzer Prizes over her career so far, uh, the first in 2001 as part of the New York Times staff for the series, How Races Lived in America and the second one in 2008 for her series, The DNA Age. The 2008 Pulitzer Prize was for her striking examination of the dilemmas and ethical issues that accompany DNA testing, using human stories to sharpen her reports. She's also received a Guggenheim Fellowship in Science Writing and is author of the short story, Asperger Love. She writes on a wide variety of topics, and her current topics of interest include math cultures, math culture, uh, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, uh, race and gender inequality in science, climate change, autism, gene drive, open science, and longevity research, all things of great interest um, uh, to many of us, including those at, here at NIH. I'd also say that um, we're really grateful to Amy. She's always been very generous with her time when we've asked her uh, to do programs with us or to talk to us. Um, and help NHGRI and help um, us understand some of the things that she's been covering and, and vice versa. And so it's been just a wonderful relationship. So Amy, you and I have known each other for many years with your reporting on the Human Genome Project. And so I thought it'd be fun if they would throw up the first uh, slide, um, you would see uh, this was something that we found in our archives, uh, something from uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and there's a photo. Uh, this was actually, um, uh, an event that took place, uh, we had a science, what we call the Science Cafe, an event at the Koshland Science Museum here in Washington, D.C. area. Um, and it was almost, it was about 10 years, I think about in a few months ago. And, um, you know, it was an example where you gave your time to come speak at, at one of our events. I, I, I would point out 
immediately that, in my opinion, uh, you are aging much better over the last decade than I am. Uh, but uh, I'll, I, I, I'll let others uh, judge how badly I'm aging, but boy, I certainly see a difference. But in any case, uh, thanks for joining us today. Maybe we could just start off by talking, you know, I'd be really curious to hear, and I'm sure people listening, you know, what, what draws you specifically to human genomics? Uh, since it's about genomics in the media, because you've written a lot about it clearly as an area of interest. What what drew you to it? So, um, well, thanks for, first of all, thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Thanks for saving that picture, which I still think I have those merrells that I was wearing in that picture, which uh, they, they've served me very well. Um, also, the Zoom filter helps on the aging. <laughs> what a Photoshop. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but so, yeah, I was trying to think back because it, it has been a long time. And um, I I got into writing about this um, in this sort of a roundabout way, but I, I had been, and this will also date me, but I, I came to the New York Times to write about um, the the internet, sort of the, the, the intersection of technology and society, really as it, as it related to the internet kind of filtering out of laboratories and into people's everyday lives. And so, and, ha and you know, it, it seems almost absurd to talk about how the internet has changed our life now, but at that, that time, uh, it was a new thing. And I sort of created a beat covering that um, at the LA Times, and I was uh, brought to the New York Times to, to write about that. And having done that for several years, um, I became interested in doing something else. But I, and I, but I, I also, at that time, um, I had my daughter um, who is now 17. So um, I, it, there was actually a personal, uh, I mean, so, you know, I tend to write about, I try to write about sort of the human and personal side of human genomics. And there, it, there was a personal thing that brought me into it, which was my own genetic testing. I, I was offered genetic testing when I was pregnant with my daughter. Uh, I, uh, my daughter's father is also Ashkenazi Jewish, and we were offered this panel of tests, which has since grown quite a bit. Um, we weren't offered it as a pre, we were offered it after I was pregnant. So it was not, uh, you know, at that time, it wasn't routinely offered um, uh, as a pre, before you're pregnant. Um, but so I was interested in it. I, I really didn't know much about genetic testing uh, at that time, I, but I, and I took maternity leave. And when I came back, I, I proposed this series of stories to look more at genetic. So to me, genetic testing, genetic technology was filtering out of scientific laboratories in a similar way that the internet had. I mean, for people who are old enough to remember it, you may see the parallel. And so, and so that, um, that intersection of, of technology and society had interested me and, and sort of the intersections of human genomics and society uh, came to interest me. You know, not so much, of course it was about the advances of, in research, but it was really about how those advances in research uh, were impacting people. Um, and so, I, you know, I was um, on the, at, at the national desk of the New York Times. So it was really sort of uh, about, about human genomics and American life, which is a little bit different from the lens uh, from, from which, mo you know, the science staff was writing about it, which was also incredibly important, obviously to describe the, the actual advances and the co contextualizing it within the field. But I was looking at, uh, I was really just drawn to, to that. I mean, I had majored in you know, I was, a, I was Amer an American studies major in college. And so, you know, I was interested in sort of the sociology of science. But, but even at the beginning of your reporting career, I mean, even before you're interested in genomics, you always seem to be interested in writing about science and technology. Where, where did that interest spark? Um, uh, I don't know if I could, I, I mean, really, like my, the internet beat was just because I was of the first generation to have, you know, email at college, and I stayed in touch with my friends through, through that period, and so I, I don't know um, that it was so much, uh, it just, it just sort of, it seemed new to me, it's, I mean, I, and I, I wanted to learn about it, I didn't know about it, maybe coming from a more humanities background, it seemed so novel to me, and it, uh, you know, just, I was just curious. Um, by the way, I want to make sure the audience appreciates that if you're watching this live and you want to submit questions, which we will get to later, um, there you can enter them in the Zoom Q&A box, or you can also enter them on social media with the hashtag uh, genomics and the media. So uh, those are two ways uh, you certainly should feel uh, 
interested and uh, if you're interested, uh, please submit away. We will get to questions from the audience um, uh, later in the in the hour. So your first Pulitzer Prize uh, in 2001, as I mentioned, was for your role in How Races Lived in America series that you did with some of your colleagues. So from, from your point of view, how have racial issues in the United States changed or stayed the same over the last 20 years? And, and, and sort of what do you see the role that science has played in all of this? Well, so for that series, um, you know, I mean, really for that series, a key point that we were trying to bring out was it is still, I think, quite relevant uh, today, although it has changed somewhat since the murder of George Floyd and last summer's protests, which were, you know, I really do think were, uh, you know, potentially a turning point in this country. But, um, you know, that series was really, we were trying to combat, but we were, we were, there was this sense that I think a lot of at least white Americans had that we were in this post-racial society that we race really wasn't an issue anymore, um, and you know we, we had moved past that. There was you know it, it was not um, there wasn't a state-sponsored segregation. There was you know we we had the civil rights laws, but um, but that the, the idea was that that really wasn't true and that race played a huge role in everyday life. But but that, that people weren't talking about it. And then so for that series, we spent a year, it was about uh, 12 of us, I think, so maybe 16 of us found pairs of uh, you know uh, white and black Americans or, and I, and there was um, maybe other races as well. Um, and, and tried to burrow into people's lives basically and just, and sort of unpack what race was in different settings. I, as I said, I had been covering the internet. So my story in that series is about two internet entrepreneurs who were partners. One was white, one was black. And I'm still like very grateful to them for letting me into their lives in the way that they did, Tim Cobb and Jeff Levy. Uh, and it was about how they had to decide who was going to be the CEO of this company. And, and the black guy, Tim Cobb, was um, more qualified. They agreed that he he had, you know, more just basic credentials and sort of the experience, but they made Jeff, the, the white guy, uh, the head, the CEO, and sort of how, what went into that decision and what, and what the, the ripple effect of that decision was. Um, so anyway, I won't go into that. But anyway, so 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 I do think that I mean, in terms of what has changed, that you know, we still had really maintained this illusion. I think a lot of people would like to have thought that race wasn't wasn't a big deal. But I mean, clearly, uh, with with George Floyd's death uh, last summer and the and the protests, and and I do think that there was a uh, a lot of white Americans you know, did. It's become this sort of like a cliche or almost used pejoratively now, but there was an uh, awakening. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm actually, part of my reporting now is sort of following that and seeing how real is that going to be and how tangible is that is that going to be? I, just to bring it back to this, so you asked about how science has played a role. So to try to bring it back to science, I mean, you know, I, I think that you can't, I'm not gonna like blame science for, for, for for all of, uh, I, I think that, that science could have done more along the way to try to break down this, this sort of pernicious stereotype that still exists and that still, you know, that we saw a little more uh, uh, in a more ugly way surface in, in recent years um, after the 2016 election. Um, you know, this idea that there is a, a natural uh, hierarchy of race. Uh, which has been a problem that has been that science has been invoked to 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 make that argument um, uh, in an unfounded way, but you know for for decades. Um, and I think that you, in fact, you're having some kind of symposium that's just all about that, aren't you, Eric? Yeah, there we are. Later later this year. So so you know uh, you know thinking about that, you know what what role do you think scientists? Uh, can play as communicators in dialogues about race? Because you certainly, it's it's fair to say sometimes we probably haven't helped the situation, but do, do you think if properly tuned, we, we we have a role to play that's important? I do. I think it's, I think you have a role to play that's really important. Um, and I, and um, some of my reporting in recent years has kind of revolved around that idea. I mean, I think that, um, I think it's 
I think it's very hard to talk about, uh, to, right? It's, it's, uh, but I think that, and I think that scientists, um, geneticists, genomicists in particular, have um, even somewhat understandably shied away from talking about it because they don't want to feed, they don't want to feed misconceptions by engaging in a conversation with, with people who are promoting them, right? They don't want to seem to somehow be, you know, they, they, um, there was a sort of idea, I, you know, when I interviewed a lot of um, human population geneticists for, for a couple of stories that I did, I think in 2018, um, this idea that, well, we don't, you know, that, that's kind of a fringe thing. And so we don't want to feed it. Um, you know, they were aware of it and they were concerned about it, but, but there was a lot of debate among, I think, geneticists about how to address that. I mean, my, you know, I'm, I'm, I was reporting on people who were being misled by, uh, you know, distortions of genetic data uh, that were coming out. And so to me, it seemed like um, these were people who were not just, you know, obvious racists who sort of openly, they weren't like members of alt-right groups or, you know, these were people who were bystanders who were, you know, a high school student, a community college student. Um, I, I interviewed a community college student who actually wrote to one of the, um, who wrote to a scientist, June Lee at the University of Michigan, who uh, had written, had authored one of the early um, human population genetics papers that was being circulated in, in sort of, um, white supremacist propaganda. And so he was saying, well, hey, I, I don't think this is right, but how do I how do I respond to it? So anyway, to, uh, to just to, <laughs> to answer your question, I think there is an important role. And I think that it's I think that it's hard. Um, but I, I I see more and more um, scientists sort of stepping up to that. So it's it's encouraging to me. But let's build on what you were just talking about, because I know you've written articles specifically about how research on human evolutionary genomics have been misconstrued and that then are used to reinforce notions of race. You know, there's an example, you know, where scientists and journalists really do need to work together to explain this complicated research to the public. You know, so what, because I mean, and, and you, you describe some of this in some of your stories, maybe tell us a little bit more about that. And maybe in retrospect, you know, what are some of the key lessons learned from that? Right. So um, I, I, um, I did a story um, that was in, in, it was really about the misinformation that was being circulated um, Right around the time, Charlottesville, uh, uh, and and um, and, it, and it was really about this idea that that you know she, current human genetics research was being sort of sliced and diced and taken um, by people um, by white white nationalists and white supremacists to try to um, rationalize or re even recruit people to their view, their ideology, uh, by sort of giving it this scientific veneer. And this is one of the, um, right, this is, uh, yeah, <laughs> so that, that's a picture. So that is a picture of um, a white nationalist group who were, had a milk chugging party. And and the the, rash, the the reason for it was that this idea that um, there is a, a, a lactose, you could maybe describe it, Eric, if you want to, but but the lactose tolerance is uh, is is more prevalent among people of European descent and and uh, evolutionary geneticists who. Um, you know, it's often very difficult, or maybe it's impossible. I don't know, but to you know, sort of trace the origin, the, the environmental um, pressure, the selection pressure on on a particular um, trait. But this is one that they think they know, which is that they think that that cattle breeders five thousand years ago that um, that there. Well, maybe Eric, I should ask you to describe. Oh, no, no, you're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> All right, um, but but basically um, there was uh, there was milk available to the European uh, or part of the European population at that time, and um, the, it, it, it created an evolutionary advantage. 
uh, people who had this mutation um, in a particular gene were uh, able to reproduce, so survive and reproduce uh, at higher rates. And so um, this, this uh, adaptation spread through the population in Europe. It also happened to have spread through a population of uh, where there were cattle breeders in East Africa, which is sort of um, ruins the, 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 the story for the white nationalists. But it wasn't, but what was difficult about this is that it's not, it's not untrue, right? There, there are um, different, there's a different distribution of, of alleles, of different alleles for a different, that, that, that in different populations that evolved for tens of thousands of years in different parts of the world and different, in different environments. And so what these white nationalists were doing were, were taking this, you know, huge uh, and unfounded leap to sort of say, well, if you're lactose tolerant, there, there's, so if, if it could happen for drinking milk, for being tolerant of milk after, chi after childhood, um, then it could be true for intelligence. It could be true, for, you know, which is what, or just general superiority. Um, and so that story um, is one that actually was really concerning to human population genetics that I interviewed for the story. John Navambre at, at um, the University of Chicago had seen this and had become concerned about it and had started to sort of introduce um, this into some of his lectures to sort of give this cautionary tale and sort of try to raise awareness and, and discussion among colleagues about you know what what geneticists should be doing about it and that's what I was um, starting to report on in that story. And, and of course, it, the, the the challenge again, getting back to the role that scientists play in interacting with journalists is, of course, there's you know there's it's conflating facts is what ends up happening to people's advantages. I mean, I mean, much of the lactose intolerance also relates to human migrations far more than it relates to race, but there ends up human migrations are influencing um, uh, patterns that we see of different uh, groups that are categorized across different racial boundaries in different parts of the world, um, but it's not necessarily causal. It just ends up being uh, a circumstance related to the history of individuals, either with related to migration or related to, to, to opportunities they had for what food to eat and so on and so forth. And what ends up, and these things are complicated. Even when you teach these things at an, to a to a college level, you know, biology class, there's a lot of nuance associated with it. And 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 so I, I think the challenge that that certainly we as scientists face is wanting to get down into the nitty gritty details. But sometimes those nitty gritty details get lost, and some of the, the 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 giving opportunities to conflate some of the facts to make it look like it's a different reality than what it is. And I I often think journalists you know, have uh, do a better job sometimes by trying to portray what is the simpler explanation because us scientists try to make it too complicated because we try to get every detail in. Well, I mean, I, I think not, I don't, I also just don't, I don't want to, I keep saying it's hard and I just don't, I don't want to understate how hard communicating about this is because I think actually like, I still, when I started reporting that story, one, um, question I had was, you know, why aren't human geneticists in the fray here? Why aren't they just on Twitter or YouTube where I'm, where I'm seeing these things surface and where I'm seeing people get confused about it? You know, why aren't they out there saying, oh, this is totally wrong. You know, this is, this is, this is what, this is the refutation, you know, we're all the same under the skin. We're uh, genetics, is, you know, and so, um, yeah, <laughs> thanks for showing that. Yeah. Could somebody please debunk this? That was actually, um, something that a, a high school student wrote uh, on Reddit, just citing some of the, the these uh, this YouTube video that I'm thinking of, the call, um, which spreads some of this this misinformation. But but just to say, it, like it, it's it's not even just a matter of journalists have maybe have a knack for being able to simplify. I mean, it's um, I, I think just to say it, like, I, I think that um, there's a lot that science doesn't know and maybe can't know, but it's it's very hard to talk about it because you, there's no really easy answer to say, well, you know, we know that, that everyone is the same because they don't. And so, and a lot of the, so the, this was sort of explained to me in the course of the reporting that you know, and people were saying, well, we, you know, we don't have, the, we don't 
have a perfect answer. Therefore, we don't want to give an answer. Um, and, but I think, like, I think, and but this could be debated, and I would be happy to, I think that people should talk about it. You know, I, I came away thinking it's better to talk about what is not known and to really explain that to the public and to say, you know, this is what we do know. This is why we can't, this is what is like going to be incredibly hard to untangle environment from genetics and history. And, you know, but, but this is how we're, how we're looking at it. I, I just think that there, I, I, I actually think um, getting some of that nitty gritty that you're talking about, uh, it would be a good thing. <laughs> and I think that, I mean, I, know, I appreciate you're saying that it's um, something that scientists and journalists can work together on. I, I think that, um, scientists, I think the ball is in the scientist's court. <laughs> I'm just going to say that because it is, it is your, uh, you know, it's our job in some ways to interpret what the, you know, to, to sort of try to communicate to the public, you know, but it is also your job. And so, and it's, um, and that's, and that's a job that is not so explicitly set out, I think, in what scientists um, are, are, you know, what, what their real job is. I mean, I, I'll just say this to you, Eric, because you fund a lot of these people. <laughs> um, and it's not like they, it isn't actually part of their job. And that's something that I, that I have concern about that, you know, it's not uh, their job is to publish research, to use the money that they're given in a, in a productive way and to, to, to publish uh, and to find out stuff, but not necessarily to, understand the social implications of it and how to communicate that. And, and I think that there is, um, is sort of a, a, an imperative to make that part of, part of what the human population genomics is. I mean, people are doing it. I'm not saying that, I, I mean, I have a lot of respect for the human population genomicists who are uh, doing it anyway uh, and taking it upon themselves to do it and believing that it is kind of their, you know, whether it's their actual job or not, it's like their moral responsibility. But um, but I don't think that it's like built into what the job of a scientist is necessarily. And I think that um, it could be, it should be. Well, you made the comment earlier that, you know, in, in some ways you wanted or you expected or you were hoping to see some of the population genesis get out there on social media and really try to uh, you know, get in the fray on this and to try to clarify it. And, and that, that raises this whole issue of, you know, how, how can scientists get the word out, especially in, in, in a contemporary society where, you know, the, the news cycles are fast, the vehicles are different. Uh, you know, I, and let's talk about social media specifically. I mean, I'll anecdotally tell you just my own experience was, you know, I, um, I'm all in favor of being as communicative as I can be, even in, in my especially in my current position. Um, and actually, the person that introduced uh, the session, uh, Sarah Bates, who's our uh, communications director at NHGRI, uh, uh, has been here just for a few years, when I wouldn't, or not even a few yet. I think it's about two and plus. And um, one of the deals I struck with her when I was recruiting her was that I would, I would get involved with Twitter and that I would, that would be a new thing I would do. I actually started it on my 60th birthday, uh, which is about, you know, almost two years ago at this point, um, and jumped in uh, with two feet and, and now I'm quite active as a vehicle that I can communicate. But, you know, it doesn't know it's, you know, you, you, you do bump into some hostility sometime. And, uh, you know, and how do you engage with people on social media, especially people who are hostile? So I, how, what advice do you have for researchers who, like me, want to be on social media, but but maybe unlike me, I'm not that nervous. But but you know, some of my colleagues who I've spoken to, they're nervous about trolls. They're nervous about negative um, dialogue. You know, what? How do you strike? Yeah. How do, what do you recommend scientists to strike that balance, especially because you're going to be dragging some. Um, of them in? I mean, I think we that we, question. Well, first of all, I'm glad you, that you're on Twitter. That's 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 great. Um, and I think that my answer to that question um, has changed over time. Like I used to feel like I had to respond to every tweet. Like if I if I tweeted a story, if I tweeted this story, and and I would inevitably get you know. Um, people who would say that I was you know that when you talk when you write about genes and race at all, you're gonna to be told that you're like, you're not intelligent, <laughs> like your low IQ, um, you know, I would get the, uh, this, this uh, you know, people would put my name in triple parentheses saying, you know, which is 
I'm Jewish. Um, I, I used to feel like I had to respond to almost everything. And now I, now I really don't feel that way. <laughs> um, uh, but I do think that there are ways, I mean, I've seen people do, um, like Twitter threads can be a way to just present complicated material that, um, that doesn't, that, you know, it takes time to, it takes a lot of time. I, I mean, I, 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 it takes time to do a good Twitter thread on, on, a, on a scientific topic. But, um, but, but those can be then circulated. Like I will point to, I've, I've pointed to several um, people's Twitter, scientists' Twitter threads to sort of give people, to give people resources. So it doesn't have to be, you know, responding to every troll, but it can be, you know, Twitter can be still a good way to, in its sort of digestible form, make a point. Um, I think that, um, what else, you know, people have written like Graham Coop has written a, a blog post about this, about, uh, it's sort of fanciful that has to do with tea drinking. Um, there, uh, there are ways of, um, communicating on social media that, do, that don't in, involve responding to every troll. And so, uh, you know, we were just showing the screen was just showing the Twitter some of Twitter exchange related to some with Mary Claire King and and I don't remember the full story behind that but but is that one that stands in your mind as oh uh, I think that that I think that was just um, <laughs> that was just because my my um, my story was the story that we were just talking about was it happened to be published during the uh, American Society of Human Genetics meeting and um mary claire king who i hadn't interviewed for the story but she was receiving an award uh at that meeting and she um encouraged people to read it so that was uh, oh, wow. I, that was that was what that was about. and then there's also been some tw twitter threads related to some of your reporting about jim watson right um right so jim watson um made the unfortunate decision in a recent documentary. So Jim Watson, uh, you know, infamously, I guess, in 2007, uh, made some comments that were published in a British newspaper um, in which he speculated without any foundation that, um, that Black people were less intelligent than white people. And he was sort of uh, excommunicated from science at that point. That was in 2007. Um, but he... Jim Watson was the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, and he, he wasn't truly, he wasn't fully excommunicated, and he sort of, um, um, uh, you know, I think began to reclaim some, some credibility. He apologized profusely at that time, um, and then just in 2019, I guess that story was in 2019, um, he was there was a documentary made about him and he chose in that documentary to repeat the the uh the statements that he had made about race and genetics um and i i wrote about the documentary and I, after that he really um you know I don't, I don't think we need to rehash the jim watson um incident but uh you know he's he's um he's over 90 and he's um he's I don't think he's well uh, in, in good health, but he, um, but because he was such a leading figure, uh, unfortunately, um, he gave, you know, he gave oxygen to these, to these misconceptions and, and people took that and they, oh, and I think the Twitter thread that you might be referring to is I, I mentioned uh, when we spoke earlier that people often like to compare him to Galileo, um, this idea that he was persecuted for telling the truth. Um, and, uh, that is something, I mean, that, that to me just speaks to this idea that for why it's so important for human geneticists to, um, not to, to engage on this topic, because there's always, there's this, the, one of the key, um, planks, I guess, of the, um, of, of white supremacist ideology that, that tries to kind of rope in science is, oh, they're just, you know, they're just suppressing the truth. They're not talking about it because they know what's true and they're afraid to admit it. And so there's this big cover up going on. Um, and so I think that, that the Watson, um, 
that I, I, I did I did a Twitter thread sort of trying to show why it was absurd to compare Jim Watson to Galileo. But I, I my broader point was was that was what I just said. Um, you know, I mean, Jim Watson, it's a complicated circumstance for us as well. I mean, if it wasn't for Jim, well, besides his discovery of the double helical structure of DNA, he was instrumental in starting the Human Genome Project. And as you know, he was the first director of our institute. Um, and so there's, the, the institute has a lot of history, with Jim, but at the same time, watching what's unfolded has been very difficult uh, for us at the institute and uh, for those of us in the genomics community who, you know, worked with Jim for many years as part of the Human Genome Project. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an example where you know, it's just difficult for everybody. There's just no question. And, 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 it, and having it play out in Twitter I, is, is also, again, it's, it's, it's so hard to, 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 to walk that line where you feel like you're doing anything productive because people aren't going to listen. If they don't have the same views you have, they're not going to, it's not going to help the situation anyway. But, but, you know, broadening this conversation, and then we're going to go on to something else. I mean, what role do you think communicators and educators can play in teaching students about race and biology? I mean, I will tell you, this is something, I, you, you know, I don't know if you've experienced with your daughter as she's growing up. I certainly experienced with, 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 my, with my kids and as they grew up. And there's a genuine interest in this. And it's not for the wrong reasons. It's actually for the right reasons. Yeah, I mean, after I did that story on um, on the the white geneticist, or the white nationalist chugging milk, and the sort of like whether geneticists could engage in that conversation, I, it, I mean, I was um, dispirited. I would say, I mean, not not. I mean, just because so many there was so much um, misunderstanding, and so many people just. Uh, that I, like average members of the public that I came across on social media who who you know weren't on on far you know, were, were Wanting that kind of information was uh, there's um, had done some studies that seemed to show. So he took he worked actually with um, Noel Rosenberg at Stanford uh, and some other um, human population geneticists to sort of build a curriculum that would um, teach really much more explicitly in high school in high school genetics, which is um, I, I you know I'm not a, I'm not an expert on on on, on what is taught nationally and on high school genetics, but but I gather that it's there's not much human population genetics uh, taught as part of the regular curriculum. And so this idea was they were going to address the misconceptions about race, but they were also going to teach you know what is known, like sort of some of the data, like like human population genetics 101, sort of human migration, evolution, a little bit. You know, so so um and they were, but they were specifically going to like the idea in the past. I, I, I guess in education circles is was sort of well, we don't want to you know conflate race and genetic ancestry. So and and you can see why like that that is a that is a mistake to do. So we're not going to put we're not going to mention race in the in 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 the genetics unit. Um, and they're they're sort of flipping that on its head and saying, well, actually, I think, you know, we should, we should, <laughs> we should try to, these are, these are things that people talk about and think about, you know, they think about athletic ability, they think about intelligence and race, and let's just like, let's just talk about it in class and, and show them like what we know and what we don't know. And um, there was, so he has some early evidence that it, we, that, that this curriculum does reduce racial essentialism, you know, they have a way of measuring a questionnaire or sort of measuring, you know, how people um, view race and genetics. And, and so it, it seemed to be effective. And so that that, that um, there's ongoing research about that to see sort of how how much um, high school education could could address this. And I, I think it's really encouraging. So, you know, that that would be um, that would be like an intervention that it, it would be it's a lot to change a high school curriculum, but I think um, that would be something that should be. And anecdotally, I mean, I certainly have seen this at the um, at the college level, um, you know, where I, I do think that that is how they are teaching. Uh, there's a lot of infusion of population genomics and immediately explaining in the context of societal discussion around issues like race. So, I mean, I, I think it, I think there's a, 
a, a step in the right direction, but I, I think backing it up to high school is probably even better. Have you seen that? I just want, have you seen that in, in um, other than historic? I mean, I, I've seen college, um, college curriculum that tries to introduce, um, that, that gives more of the history of eugenics. In, in America and in the world, and in and sort of sort of owning that eugenics was a part of you know, the field, um, and I I I think it's one thing, and I think that's important, and it's really important. And I have talked to a lot of you know human geneticists, geneticists actually who felt like they didn't even know that about their own field, and so I mean, learning it now is is um, sort of comes as a shock even to them. And so, so I think that incorporating that into a curriculum is really important, but I, I, I do, I just wanted to say, I think it's different to teach the history of eugenics than it is to teach like current research and how it intersects with our conceptions of race and ancestry. I, I, it's anecdotal. I, my dad, both of my kids at undergraduate institutions taking genetics classes saw the real science. Uh, presented in a, in a very realistic way. And so I do think it was very much, uh, you know, but it's anecdotal and, and equals too. But I was curious and I was looking for it. Yeah, I wanted to add actually, because I I, um, I I did some reporting for a story that I have not yet written and I, I, I may not get to write it, but I, um, but there's a, a really great resource at that the um, Human Genetics Department at the University of Chicago has put on the web that uh, they, they, after the, after the George Floyd protests last summer, they um, formed a reading group uh, or a, yeah, a reading group about, uh, uh, that was really about, specifically about the field of human genetics and race and how to, and, and they asked really provocative questions and, and talked about it in a way that I think was, um, just going back to what you had said about how, how geneticists can communicate about this. I think it, like a lot of them talked about just needing to practice talking about it. And um, I regret not having to, not having actually written that story because I spent some time with them, but COVID took over my reporting at some point. But, um, but that's a good, I, I will, I don't know if I can put a link or something, but I, I uh, but if you just Google it, um, they have a good resource also. Right. Let's shift gears. I want to move now to genomic testing. And as part of your series of DNA age, you were an early tester uh, of 23andMe. Can you tell us more about that experience and how did this help frame your understanding of genetics and ancestry and how did it influence your coverage as a, as a, as a science writer? Yeah, I was an early, an early tester. Maybe, yeah, I was of, of 23andMe. I mean, that was, it was a long time ago. Um, I remember, the feeling of possibility there definitely and you know the sense of like wow you could like google your own dna you know you could sort of see well do i have this sense of taste like you know is there is the reason that cilantro is bitter to me or brussels sprouts were bitter to me is that because of my dna or yeah you know, but i mean it, it also i think made me feel um gave me a sense of caution that I think was a healthy sense of caution about, uh, you know, this, this belief that um, it's when you start thinking about genes a lot, you start to, like, it's, it's hard. DNA has a very, um, has this strange power. <laughs> People really want to believe that everything has to do with their DNA. And, um, and so I think that, that, that 23 and the experience taught me that I, I, I could fall into that. Like just believing that, and that, and that, and to sort of, you really need to to ask, you know, what are the limits of this knowledge? What is the scope of it? I mean, you don't want to underplay it, you, you, but but what are the limits of it? Um, so I think I, I then I tried to do more of that through my through my subsequent reporting. So so on that in in two thousand seven, you wrote a story about Katie Moser, who's the young woman who tested positive for the Huntington's disease uh, mutation. Um, and then I, even this weekend, I went back and I reread the article you wrote about catching up with Katie again this year on her 40th birthday. Can you tell us about Katie and how her story has helped you convey difficult stories like hers? Yeah, can, that Kate, the story about Katie in 2007 was the first of, of this of the series that you mentioned earlier that that one Pulitzer called the DNA Age, and I I um, I. In that series, the idea was to try to get, you know, sort of wrap our heads or <laughs> our heads around 
what it would be like to learn something about ourselves, whether it was a disease predisposition or um, you know something about our behavior, our particular traits, um, whether it was conclusive as you know so it, or or partial or whether it might affect our family members like what what we could all start to learn now because of of the of the advent of genetic testing that we couldn't learn before and did we want to learn these things and, and what, what would that be what would that mean to our families to ourselves um, our self our self-image um and so keep the case of katie um was a really extreme case right so she was in her early 20s when i met her she had her grandfather had had Huntington's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease that, you know, it, it, and it, and it, it, the symptoms start to show usually in midlife. Um, and if you have the, the gene expansion that, that causes Huntington's, you, you know, you will, you will certainly get it unless you get something else first, right? And so, um, so it was a very um, unusually for genetics, a very definitive um uh, gene ex genetic trait to have, um, and Katie was so was young, and and many young people who have it in their families don't get tested, and it didn't at that time. I think it is a little bit more now. And the idea of the story was, well, you know, here's here here's this. What? How do you how do you live with that knowledge? And because we we all maybe can start to have partial knowledge, or, or uh, you know, something maybe less definitive and less. Um, Possible. Um, but Katie, um, so, so that was what the story was about at the time. And it was sort of how she, you know, her first couple of years of, of learning and, um, you know, there's no, there's no perfect answer. I mean, it's, 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 it gives, it gave her life some shape that, that it did that, um, she, I think, and as I tried to write in the, in the recent update, um, she and I have stayed in touch over, over these years. And I think that she, um, she used that to very much seize the day. You know, she really, um, she, she, she has traveled, she has um, taken risks in her life that are, uh, you know, um, she may not have taken otherwise. Um, she is very, she is such a joyful person and funny. And um, she, she has uh, also like just put a lot into trying to raise money for Huntington's research. Um, so Katie is a, uh, um, I think when I spent, I spent almost a year kind of in her life, not, not full time, but she, but she did say, um, she, she, I had spent trying to wrap my head around what this was like for her. She began to wonder if I was really a journalist or if I just kind of liked hanging out with her. <laughs> she was like, is this story ever going to run? Um, do you still work for the New York times? But, um, you know, um, it's also, it also, I think is a little bit of a, uh, Genomics hasn't come up with the with a cure for Katie yet. Um, still some time, but we're hoping. So more recently, we've all been hijacked by COVID nineteen, and over the last eighteen months, you've written literally dozens of stories covering different aspects of the pandemic. Um, you've touched on a personal side of the topic and and displayed the magnitude of the effects of COVID on on members of our society. You know, how do these personal stories affect you as a journalist? Um, yeah, I, uh, well, it, it's, it, it goes in different waves, I guess. I mean, there was a, there was a point where, you know, we were writing sort of every, not, you know, not just me, but really large team of journalists at the times, of course, have been covering this, uh, covering the pandemic and the human toll of the pandemic uh, in the United States. So for my colleagues on the national desk and, and also on the science desk. Um, and so um, there, it's hard. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, it's, we, we, I've talked to a lot of people who have lost, um, lost family members to COVID. Um, I, I, um, earlier, I guess, um, last year, and then still through the early part of this year, you know, we were doing sort of every 100,000 death milestone. Um, I participated in several of those stories. And um, I think this one that, that, that you're showing was, right, it was like the 400,000 death um, milestone. We're almost at 
700,000 now, but, but, but that, that was especially, um, it, was such a, it was such a hard month, basically. It was the, the pace of death, it was so fast. And, and so um, we did, in a lot of these stories, we struggled to think about how to convey it, you know, how, how, to, how to make it um, not just another, another milestone story. Um, in that case, we did, we did a story that was just one day, we tried to talk, a team of us talked to, I don't know how many, like maybe a few dozen um, families who lost somebody in a day. That, at that point, it was about 2,000 deaths a day. It's, it's still 2,000 deaths a day. Now it's back to 2,000 deaths a day now. But um, the idea there was, was to try to counter our own, I mean, there, there's this term psychic numbness. And I think that as a reporter, you, you, um, you know, I, I, I reported on this idea that other people were experiencing psychic numbness because of the, because of the toll of COVID. And, and then I kind of realized like I had, I was experiencing psychic numbness. And so, um, and sort of, you want to try to denumb yourself because it, it's, uh, you know, you want to, you need to kind of protect yourself, but at the same time, you don't want to be numb because you want to be able to report the, the grief and the, and the, and the, the sadness that is happening. Did any of your colleagues particularly struggle? I mean, your struggle cover or sort of wanted to stop covering it because they were finding it too difficult to cover? Yeah. I mean, I, I yes, without sharing like personal oh, stories. Of course very, not. Uh, I mean, many of us at, at, you know, at different times during this, during this, how long has it been during this, during this pandemic, um, have had, uh, you know, have had to take a step back or, and, and the times has really has been very um, good about providing us with resources and, and urging us to take breaks and understanding that, and sort of rotating a lot of us through the, and that's why it's just such a, such a big team of people. It's, um, um, uh, because because it does take a toll. Right, right. So we've actually had a bunch of questions that have come in um, on the Q and A, and to to be a little bit uh, uh, more efficient in trying to cover, I'm going to ask Sarah Bates to come back into our Zoom chat, um, and when she does, I I hope that she sort of sorted through them and can maybe ask some of those questions that you think are particularly. Um, appropriate to ask based on the conversation that Amy and I have had so far. And we'll use the last, you know, we have about eight more minutes and I wanted to make sure some of these questions got asked. Sure, yeah, we've had a ton of questions come in. So thank you everyone who submitted them in the, in the Zoom Q&A or over social media. Uh, I'll try to combine a couple, Amy, in, in, the, in the interest of time. Uh, I, one question that a, a couple people have had, and, and I also am curious about, is at what point do you know something that you're researching is a story? You know, wh whether it's ready to be on the New York in the New York Times and reach so many people. I'm thinking because of the nature of genetics and genomics, you know, so much so much of it is so personal. And if you're talking about things that can affect people's health or decisions that they make um, for, for long term health decisions, uh, you know, you talked about your own prenatal experience. You know, at, at what point do you report on on things like that? You know, how do you make those decisions? And at what point do you bring it to your editor? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, if you, um, a lot of these stories, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I do get some time to report these stories. Um, but it, it, it and, and that my editors have been patient with me and to, um, to make sure that we feel like it, it's, um, that it's ready to go. Um, so, I mean, you know, the one that we talked about the most maybe here, uh, which was about the, uh, the milk chugging human geneticists, uh, not the human, the milk chugging white nationalists, and how they were um, misconstruing human genetics. Uh, you know that, that took a, quite a, quite a while, and and we um, I reported it from several angles. You know, I, I was I, I wanted to make sure that I had you know that I understood what was happening among people who were observing this, sort of like bystander members of the public, and then also what what white nationalists were really doing with it, and what geneticists were. How they were absorbing it, and so um, you know, uh, again, it's different from. I mean, because of my particular lens, which is trying to combine combine the science with the impact, which is the social impact. It's a little. It's different from you know writing about a, 
a, a paper that was published in a top journal that week or, you know, which, um, which has its own, you know, skills that need to be applied. But um, so, so I, I don't have a, there's, it, it, de it depends on the story. I mean, that's my, my wimpy answer to that. It really, it really can, can depend. Um, some of the COVID stories, you know, things were changing so quickly every day. And, and so there was a lot of the pace of those stories was pretty fast. Um, and again, that's why we often combined, we often teamed up um, with, you know, large groups to do those stories because people, we had people calling people all over the country. And so, um, so those were faster than some of the, uh, the longer, these longer features that I've done. So, so another question we, we've got, we've gotten is uh, how, how do you convey some of the nuances in terms as they evolve? So I'm thinking of terms like uh, like race or gender, um, you know, or these issues of self-identity, uh, because I know they, they do change depending on who you're talking to and, and they've changed, they've changed over the decades. Um, so how do you express those nuances in your writing? That is a good question too. Um, and actually I'm, I'm working on a story right now that we'll, uh, we'll get at that in kind of a, a hopefully in an in, in, in depth way, but, um, but, um, you know, I mean, I think the, the main thing is in terms of asking people, uh, I, I try to ask everyone how they would like to be identified. I mean, I think that in terms of really understanding how, how somebody, uh, because the time says, you know, the time style also evolves. So, you know, it's our, we have our own style book in terms of how to address identity issues. I actually did, um, I did a story uh, a couple of years ago in which, which was about um, gender neutral driver's licenses and, and how many states were, there were there were bills and contested bills in a bunch of different states to have gender neutral driver uh, gen, uh, and also you know birth certificates, um, and it was the first story in the Times in which uh, we identified everybody by their pronoun, like people who were cis also cis uh, people who, who were of any gender. We just we and it was just to, and it was just to kind of make a point about identity and the idea that there were. A range of gender identities and that people could start to think about that um so so it sounds like that's something that the new that the times and and some of your colleagues are are really thinking about then in your reporting there's a lot of discussion about that at the times right now yes so i know we'll have we only have a few more minutes and we have so many questions that we won't be able to get to them, but we'll try to address them, everyone, on, on, on our social media feeds uh, when we can. Um, I, I think one more question for you, Amy, is if you had sort of one tip for people who are interested in, in communicating more about genomics, what would it be? You know, this could be for scientists. I know you want the genomics research community to really get in the game, if, or if it's for aspiring science writers, um, what would you tell them? Oh, man, one tip. <laughs> Uh, it could be many tips we have. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go back to my appeal to uh, an HGRI. I think on this one, which is because I, I don't, I don't really want to put it on individual scientists, you know, or even individual journalists. Like I do think that talking about this stuff that we're talking about, race and genetics, ancestry, human population genomics. I, I feel like there needs to be a structural change and, and, and honestly, just like a financial incentive to, to, to make it, or I don't know if it's financial, but it's just like a professional, like a part of the profession in a way that it, it isn't currently. And, you know, there's, I think that, the, I know, I think that you have a whole um, ethical, legal, social impact. That's part of the it's part of your budget. You have a, what, how much of the budget is devoted to that? 5% of our budget goes to our ethical, legal, and social implications research program. Okay. So like to me, but I, as I, as I've reported on it, I know that there's a, a lot of that goes to, you know, important topics like, you know, how do you guard somebody's genetic privacy? You know, how do you return research results to uh, research participants when something, you know, when you discover something about them that they might not know? There, there are lots of like legal and ethical issues to grapple with, but I haven't found that that this particular intersection of, you know, race and genetics is, is part, is has really traditionally been thought of as part of what ELSI does. So to me, um, 
And I, and I just want to make a plug for that. <laughs> and I want to make a plug for also for being part of what actual, like, I mean, it's, of course, it's really important to involve social scientists in this because they have thought it through and they have, they understand race in a way that genetics, you know, people who, who do genetics aren't, aren't researching race. And I understand that, but, but I also think, so I just want to, but I think it's very important to have the actual genetics researchers involved in those discussions. And so I, I, how they can, how, I don't have a specific tip for how they should do it, but I just think that the, that the, the, the field as a whole needs to kind of come to a way that it's, it's more integrated into what is part of the, the profession. Oh, we, we, we take your point, Amy. Actually, I'm sure there are people who are watching this both at the Institute and in the community, you know, you gave them something to think about. So I, I actually appreciate your candidness um, I'm giving a suggestion, which I think is something that we should be thinking about and, and wondering what additional role we could play um, in, in doing that kind of science. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap this up here um, by, first of all, thanking Amy. Uh, this hour went by like a flash. I thought we were talking about 15 minutes. I knew it was going to because I knew we'd have fun um, in, in discussing some, a number of fascinating uh, topics. Um, so my deep appreciation as always, Amy, and uh, we hope you will remain a, a friend and colleague and do similar programs like this with us in the future. I, I would love to. Thanks. It was, it was a great conversation. Good to okay. see you, Eric. Um, Thanks, Sarah. And I'm going to turn this now over to Sarah to close us out. Yes, thank you both. This was a fantastic conversation. I just want, you know, thank you again. This, this conversation was recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So if you missed part of it uh, or you're only getting this last section, you can relive the entire thing at your leisure. Our next event will be November 4th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And that will feature our special guest, Dorothy Roberts, who is a professor of law and sociology and civil rights at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also the author of Fatal Invention, Killing the Black Body and other works. Uh, so we're very excited about that conversation with her. I will be moderating. Please start tweeting your questions with the hashtag genomics in the media and visit genome.gov slash GAM for details. Thank you again for joining us.